can we use Mid Journey to make a 12 pack but of yes. forehead muscles? Uh, like you get oh, so smart what? listening to this podcast that you get mental abs. <laughs> Episode go. 12, baby! Welcome, everybody, to AI for Humans. Kevin, what do we have on today's show? We have got incredible new imagery tools that will let you make video from mere text. What, what is this? 2023? <laughs> Also, you can drag your photos and morph them into all sorts of weird digital nightmare fuel. We'll show you how. Google's Deep Mind claims that they're coming after OpenAI and ChatGPT. They're going to crush the AI competition. We're going to have more on that. And the Grimace Shake is not anything I had on my bingo card for this year, but the Grimace Shake has taken over TikTok. And we have, Gavin, a very special guest. We've got a Ooh, chef. Who do we have today? world famous presenter and an idiot sandwich enthusiast Gordon Rams AI will be here to tell us all about the Grimace <laughs> Shake. <laughs> Welcome to our show. AI for Humans is a exploration of AI, I would say. It is a it is a fascinating dive into the world of artificial intelligence and the tools and tips you need to survive. It is also eight grind core things that you can do to make money with ChatGPT, right Kevin? Oh, let me tell you why three AI experts absolutely hate us. They're nauseated by this podcast. One of my little treats every week, Gavin, is watching you grab the machete and go thwacking through the weeds to try to figure out how to succinctly describe whatever the hell this podcast is each time. Because I, I, like, I see it. I see you recognize it. It's on the horizon. It's, oh, we're, it's a broad discussion and celebration of AI. You usually say that it's, what, is it AI for smart people who like dumb things? Yes, that's, that's kind of this temporary slogan that we've come up with. Our brand we got to codify this. <laughs> yeah, because if I try, I want to get it tattooed on my body, but I can't have it mm. struck through every week and go, I will not have enough abdomen to have it completely oh, you written will. out in Don't old worry. English. In the future, in the future you can add abdomen. <laughs> yeah, that's <right. laughs> that's no, coming. Oh, sweet. Abdomen ad is coming. Yeah, it's a new AI drop that's coming next You've week. tried the 12-pack, but have you got the 24-pack? <laughs> Add abs Siri, to your add sides. abs. Add abs yes, to your exactly. back. <laughs> oh, now we got abs out, on like, forehead. Abs. abs on forehead. Can we use Mid Journey to make a twelve pack, but yes. of forehead muscles? Uh, like you get oh, so smart what? listening to this podcast that you get mental abs. <laughs> this is a great idea. Next week we will do mental ab forehead abs. Have you flexed your brain today? AI for humans. <laughs> Look, I, I can then, do it myself. Yeah. If you're on video, you can see my own mental abs. I've got them. Oh, already. dude, he's I'll on stick. trend. He's he's got those brain gains. Look at that. Yes. Look at that. Yes. <laughs> All right. Every week on this show, we do dumb things with AI. Speaking of abs, the funny thing is, there's a pretty famous photo, a uh, video of of uh, now, I guess, presidential candidate <laughs> RFK Jr., who you, you know everybody has their own thoughts on, and but he's very much in the news right now. And he turns out to be one of the buffer presidential candidates we've ever had. The man is almost 70. I think he's 69. Um, and he is actually pretty buff, right? It's a pretty impressive. Now, he's not, like, pushing a ton of weight. But also, like, at 69, the fact that he's got this going on, which, you know, is not a bad thing. So I decided why Just not Just a violation of gym make- etiquette, Gavin. I can't let you get away with that. He's not pushing oh. a lot of plates. Okay, let's not shade his load, bro. <laughs> I I think it's the photo you're talking about. He's on an incline bench press. He's got a little couple weights on the side. He's pushing it up. I think he has a cigarette popped out of his mouth as well, and he's ashing into his muscle milk. He's wearing jeans. He's shirtless shirtless with jeans. That's right. So anyway, in order to do the dumbest thing I could with AI, I thought, wow, what would it look like, you know, if other presidents were buff? And so I spent a good, like... (laughs) Three to six hours look and using Mid Journey to create buff presents. So I, Kevin's not seen these yet. No. So Kevin, I want you to bring up the I just, folder that I, I just sent pulled you. up a folder and I'm laughing because like I love the way your brain works always. And then yeah. it just says buff presidents. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I want you to see go the, through each of these and I kind of like we're gonna we'll bring these up. I, I want you. To, I want you to talk about each of them. So the yeah. order which with Google Drive has presented it to me begins with. Obamabuff.png. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I don't want to be flagged, government. This is not about me doing anything wrong. This is just a dumb thing. This I is a AI. celebration. Yeah, it's almost 4th of July. This is what 4th of July should be. We should just turn 4th of right. July into Swole, Pres Swole President Day, and we could just yes. turn it in, and everybody can create their own Swole Presidents. Monster Swole truck presidents engine rev noise, bald president. eagle streaking across the horizon, <laughs> doing a sick flex as fireworks shoot off. This is Obama in what looks to be a very ornate presidential room of sorts. Yeah, beautiful tapestries. I think it might be a version of the Oval Office. It's it's some sort of version of some sort of. It maybe not the do they Oval have office, but close candelabras like that in there. Regardless, he is wearing a nice white button up shirt with a thick collar. The sleeves have exploded off of this thing yes. though, and he yes. is very vascular, very stern yep. face, very serious, and um, he's got his plate stacked in a very interesting way. He's got. What looks to be a 53 on one side, I think a, yeah. a 57 on the other side, and then a bunch of two and a half pound weights. Uh, exactly. He's got like capping it 12 up. two and a halves on either side, which is, by the way, like an aesthetically pleasing stack of plates because it does look like almost like a Tootsie Roll coming out of the big ones. So. <laughs> That's right. He yeah. is utilizing the entire bar and you have to respect that. He's also got his finest lifting belt on, which is just a fancy dress belt. No real back yes, support exactly. there. Is this Mid Journey or is this Stable Diffusion? This How do so, we yeah, make this? So this is all in Mid Journey. I again used what I've talked about in the show, the photorealistic prompt, which again, I, I can't tell you is like such a great shortcut to get better Mid Journey prompts. And if you haven't done it, you should definitely use it. <laughs> what do you, which one I, are you looking at now? I went to the next image, which is George Washington looking kind of like the Quaker Oats guy in front of a statue of himself? Well, what I love about the George Washington one, he kind of looks like Hulk Hogan. Like, he's got the yes. same sheen to him. Do you know what I mean? And, like, George Washington is, like, ready to, he's ready to rumble. But he's also very happy. Like, who knew the president was that a happy of a guy? He looks very happy. Wow, okay. And we've hit buff Trump, and we are three mere yes. photos into this. <laughs> and he is doing a commando-style workout. So Trump is in the woods somewhere. He's, I think, working out with, like, weights that he designed himself in some form. <laughs> That's right. But he's pushing like one of the interesting things with the trump one is i added strongman competition to this prompt so you get a slightly different variation on it he's got an interesting grip though on it there's pronated like a, or inverse grip but he is actually looks like he's broken his wrists and turned his hands around 360 degrees to grip it and amazing says forearm that's the next muscle and fitness says that's the big next thing is the, that is, is the, the broken new trend wrist. is to flip, just shatter flip, your flip, wrists and rotate your arms yeah. <laughs> oh wow is is this lincoln yeah is lincoln lincoln is in there i don't like it i can't i don't no. even want to comment on lincoln yeah there's that, that the through. metal has gotta hurt those nips we'll we'll put a bunch of stuff through here i stopped on clinton because like you know he is a natty athlete you can tell not yep, juicing exactly. that's a nat that's a natty yep. build and he's proud of it yep. he's at what looks to be like a muscle beach flexing showing it off he could be a pit fighter you, you know Bill Clinton's going to take his, his body to the public, right? He's not going to hide it. He is not jacked uh, up in a, in a crazy way, but he looks natural. Now, I want you to, before we go on, look at the Bushes, President Bush <laughs> and his, his son. Oh, wow. So, this one was interesting. Yeah, so describe what you're seeing here because this is an interesting thing. Bush Sr., looking fantastic, by the way. Fountain of Youth, clearly yeah. juiced to the tatties. Yes, shirtless. Yes. Very vascular. His son, though, looking to be older than him with the white Hanes T-shirt on. And they've gone to some foreign area yes. to train. Yeah, they're doing some cage fighting, maybe some Muay Thai. Uh, but they're there to train. And dad has become hashtag fit goals. So I will give one note before we move on from here. The older the president was, it's funny because George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, I feel like there are enough portraits of them that you can get out. But... George Bush Sr., I tried JFK. Weirdly, they were not easy to get to do this with. And I, I think it's in mm. part because more photos exist of, of more recent president. I tried Nixon. Nixon mm -hmm. I didn't get very good results on. So I don't know why exactly, but long story short, these are buff presidents. This was something incredibly dumb that I did. <laughs> and I think it was fun. That's we'll great. put up a thread of all of them. So many dumb things came out of my noggin this week, thanks to some new tools which got released. First and foremost, I, I made some TikToks and a couple tweet posts about it. Drag Gan is now out mm -hmm. in the world. 
Dragan is a tool that lets you manipulate imagery by clicking and adding little points to the imagery and telling it to drag or expand the image in a direction. And when we saw the tool a couple of weeks ago, at least little demos of it, we saw them modifying the shapes of vehicles or changing the position of like a model's hand on their body. Yeah. And it looked like magic, like most AI yeah. tools when you don't have a chance to get your hands on it. Well, now it's out. You can play with it. It's easy to run. We'll put a link in the show notes. You can go over to Hugging Face and run the demo right on their website or download the code and build it yourself. But you can take any GAN generated image, and I'll get to that, and manipulate it. So it works as advertised. I, I made a video of taking a model that was posed and I moved their hand from their thigh up to their waist and then had it outstretched. I took people's faces and took their eyes and spread them so far apart that their head exploded like the lady yeah, in Total Recall. Scary. Really yeah. scary, <laughs> odd, bizarre stuff, but a very interesting and fun way to manipulate the media and watch the, the GAN, which is the, the system that powers these types of images, watch it hallucinate in real time as it tried to go step by step because it takes your starting point and slowly moves it inch yep. by inch, pixel by pixel to the finish point. That's pretty cool. You said GAN. What does that mean exactly? And and what is it doing? Because I think one of the things is is not like generating a new image for each of these. Is it or, or is it? It is actually, yeah. So a GAN, okay. uh, G-A-N stands for Generative Adversarial Network. And that's how Midjourney, Stable Diffusion, that's how these image generating tools create the images that they make. And remember, big dumb, not so smart. Mm -hmm. The distillation of this is that the adversarial part of the network comes out when it starts with a bunch of dots, a bunch of noise, and then it, you tell it, make a picture of a cat wearing a sombrero and it goes okay i think i know what a cat looks like and i think i know what a sombrero looks like let's manipulate these dots a little bit and see if we're any closer to a cat or a sombrero then an adversarial part of that network looks at the image and goes nah, that's not really there try again and it's this feedback loop that goes again and again and again until hopefully what you get out of it is the image that you ask for this is part of the reason why with ai tools especially images it takes a lot of compute to do that because the computer has to crunch those those back and forth a lot. That's right. It's starting with a sea of noise, and you can actually control that noise, and then it is iterating step by step by step by step and trying to figure out how to make that noise resemble the thing that you want. So what's interesting about this tool is that, again, let's say you have a, a photo of like a dog that's looking off to the left, and you want it to go to the right. You could click on its nose and click on the other side and say, go for it, and it's going to take that piece of the photo and slowly put it off to the side and then try to generate the image around that and then move it again and generate the image around that. Or you can be specific and targeted with the tool, even mask the section that you want it to move and it will lock the rest of the image so that you can get some really interesting looks and feels out of it. Again, change the position of people, move objects around in a scene, but it only works with images that have been created in a GAN. So you can't just take uh. a photo drop it into the program and then edit it. There are, however, tools that you can use to convert a normal photo into a GAN created photo, one that gives it the weights and the information that it needs to manipulate it. So with an extra step, you could take someone's photo and give them a big old joker smile or make them move their arms around. As a standalone tool, something fun to play with right now. But if you go and look at the videos or if you happen to run it on Hugging Face and give it a try, know that this type of feature will be screaming into a Photoshop or similar right. tool in the near future. That's awesome. I think you could definitely go check out Kevin's uh, thread and uh, TikTok about it. Okay, we have one more quick dumb thing Kevin did. He spent a lot of time yeah. this weekend with something called Zeroscope. Yeah, so the text to video movement, you know, you and I have said on this very podcast, in two years time, we're going to have Hollywood quality movies being generated by the machine. And maybe it's five years. But the point is, we will get there. And more pudding of proof is that <laughs> zero scope version two XL. What a sexy name. God, just got figure released. Out better names. We got to figure really out better do. names for this stuff. Gen so, two uh, text to video. Like, please God yeah. call it like Hermes or call it like Wilbur. I'd love it. I'd love a AI tool called Wilbur. And it just like, well, come meet Wilbur. He's your old friend that can make videos out of text. Like Wilbur is the thing I want. So AI developers. Wilbur is just please. chat GPT, but it gets lost in thought halfway through <laughs> and starts just Honestly, talking about the good that. old days. Yeah. 
How does mRNA work? Well, let me tell you. Me of what, a time I learned something you. about mRNA back in the day, but but first, <laughs> let me tell you how it affects corn. Do you know what corn is? Corn is something <laughs> you can eat and it's delicious. Uh, Cheryl, do you got some corn for me right now? You go to town on this hard candy while I whittle. <laughs> Oh, okay, so I just I sit here okay, for Wilbur. 15 minutes while you whittle. What are we What are we talking about here? Some sort of text to video thing. Oh, right? sorry, Wilbur. Uh... So months ago, there were little clips of, and the exciting thing that just hit this week is Zeroscope. It is an open source, completely free text to video generation tool set that works within the interfaces that 11, you might 11? be used to. That's right, automatic yeah. one 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 one. Terribly named interface no, 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 to no, stable no. diffusion. Automatic like eleven this. eleven. Come on. Okay. Let's let's normalize this. Wilbur tells me it's automatic eleven eleven. <laughs> yes, thank you, Gavin. The front end to stable diffusion, which lets you generate still imagery. There is a text to video extension that you can install there, and then you yep. can put the models from Zeroscope in there and generate stuff. I'm going to release a tutorial on how to do this. There's plenty of YouTube Ooh. videos on how to do that now. But yeah, the reason I want to release my tutorial is that it's for big dumbs and you can just run it Great. on a run pod. So I was making videos for 50 cents an hour, generating all sorts of nightmares That's awesome. versus having to pay 15 bucks or 30 bucks to runway to use their tools. Now, if you're watching the video of this podcast on YouTube, I apologize, but you're seeing some of my hallucinations on the screen right now. We've got all sorts of people or presidential figures eating hot dogs. You're seeing a really cute little puppy dog bouncing around or a cool weird uh, okay, let's, tarot Okay, let's pause art. on that one. I've seen a couple more of these clips of weirdly of animals. I saw one of a squid that somebody did online. Looks really good. Like, mm -hmm. I, like it. you can tell when you watch it walk, it's still not perfect, but visually it looks way better than anything I'd seen come out of Gen 2. Is there any reason behind that? Or is it just because it's a better model because it's more recent? Like what's your take on that? I bet it has to do with the, you know, tens of thousands of videos that went into the machine. Like, I don't know right. how many videos there were of Bob Barker eating hot dogs or anyone eating right, hot right. dogs for that matter. Right, exactly. But I'm sure there was yeah. a ton of open source animal footage that got swept into it. And what's really nice is that there was a second there, Gavin, where I was saying like, ah, oh, the text to video stuff, man, that's gonna be the premium feature that the big wigs get, right. the mega corpse. Right. And it's gonna cost us hundreds of dollars to play with these toys. And this release gives me hope. I, I still think that our hypothesis is correct that open source might lag a little bit, might be 10% less effective, but it can still get you there yeah. and for free. Yeah. So yeah. in the hacker that's community, really cool. we still believe. I think that <laughs> building this stuff in public is great and I love it. I think it's amazing. And I do believe in the hacker community and open source. I've also been hearing things lately, which is like, there's, you know, I've been filling my brain with some of the doomer stuff. Just, I've been listening to a few podcasts and reading a few books and like, it does worry me in some ways that this stuff is out there in that, like, we're just going to keep doing this and there's no stopping it now, but we're on for the ride, man. And we're just going to see how it goes because like, there's a future where, I want tools to be available to everybody. I hate a world where like people can't do things that uh, that like you know the quote unquote elites can do, but like right. I think in a world where everybody has access to these tools, again, it just goes back to trust and and how we're going to have to see this stuff because once these get really good, it's going to be a lot of stuff coming out there that you're going to have to be aware might be generated by AI. So let's just keep that in mind as we talk about all video tools and all photo tools. Um, it allows people to, it's going to allow people to create things that you would not believe. And it will also allow people to create things they will try to get you to believe. So I think that's an important thing. Wherever your bunker may be located, just make sure you have enough bandwidth to get this podcast. And that's the <laughs> dumb stuff we did. Should we get to your favorite part of the podcast? Uh, I was just going to do it, man. You know where we're going. It's time for the news. <laughs> It's very weird going from a person that does beep boop sounds into a serious newscaster, but here I am. Today, the biggest news I think that we've seen for a while is a heating up in the, I want to call it the AI wars, let's call it that, which in the future may be a completely different thing. In the future, that will be used to describe something terrible, but right now, it describes the big companies that are kind of fighting back and forth about who has domination. I think we both agree right now, OpenAI and ChatGPT, GPT-4 specifically, is, is probably your best bet. But 
If you missed the story maybe a month ago, Google, who struggled to kind of come back into this world after they could have been leading it, um, combined two parts of their company. They combined like kind of Google's AI mix with another company called DeepMind. And DeepMind, if you don't know, is the company behind AlphaFold and all these other really giant AI success stories of the last five, 10 years. They combined the two and now DeepMind is releasing a new chatbot that they're codenamed Gemini. And supposedly, Kevin, this is going to crush ChatGPT, and it's going to be a much better version of everything that ChatGPT does. What is your take on this? Do you believe this? We've seen Bard. I don't necessarily think that Bard was exactly what everybody expected. No. It has a lot of problems. Where, where do you think this is, where this lands? I love this. Oh. I love this so much, Gavin. This reminds me of hip-hop artists battling over who's going to ah. have the hottest, hottest single of the summer. You know, I'm going to be number one on the billboard charts. My GPT is going to crush your language model. Yeah, great. Bring it. I love this ish. Now, DeepMind did things like beat world class chess champions and yep. beat Dota defense of yep. the ancients. Is that what Dota stands for? It's yep. been so long. So. They were using AI, not language models, but their own cognition and learning tools to crush humans at their own games. Yep. And now what they're saying is, hey, look, we got these language models, but DeepMind excels at the reasoning abilities of all these machines. We're going to put that on top of the language model, and we are coming for you, OpenAI. And I love this stuff. This is the pre-fight press conference of tech giants, Gavin. Oh, I, How so, do we yeah, not exactly love the showmanship? Yeah, I know. It's like, are you ready for the next AI chatbot? And it yeah. will only kill us in three years, not one. <laughs> how do you how do you kind of connect that part into all this, right? It's yeah. like you we're going to touch gloves, and then all of humanity is going to touch the canvas. <laughs> bye bye. It's pretty funny, actually. Imagine you're watching a fight between like two of the best MMA fighters, and then what happens ultimately is that MMA fighter is going to get cloned and come to your door and beat you up. Okay, so Gemini. When I think about Deep Mind's reasoning sensibilities, they're multi modalities, meaning right now. A lot of these, um, these language models are just trained on text, right? We've, we talked about this before, but just gobs of data swept into it, but mostly written words. And what they're saying is that this tool will be trained on multimodality. Could that mean mm -hmm. billions of YouTube videos, which Google is sitting on, so. on a server yes, somewhere, right? So. Ingesting yeah. that, audio sources or podcasts. The multimodality is interesting. That opens up new pathways to learning. And when I hear about the reasoning, you know, he's saying that we're going to crush chat GPT, but that would be as it exists today, as, right. as deep mind knows it exists. And chat GPT on its own doesn't have a lot of reasoning built in. Now there's a bunch of tools that have been built or there's special prompts that you can do to get chat GPT to think about what it's written, the code that it's hallucinating. And we know that the responses get better markedly. So, mm -hmm. so what I'm imagining here is that deep mind is saying, Hey, again, we have that reasoning loop. We know how to think critically about what we're doing. You've got this big old language model. We can strap multimodality and reasoning onto that, and we can crush GPT, which I believe. And I think you're absolutely right. That's exactly what's going to be happening behind the scenes. I do want to mention one other thing that DeepMind has done recently, which really freaked <laughs> oh, me okay. out. DeepMind does, is a very large company, and as, as Kevin mentioned, they did a lot of things. And AlphaFold, as I mentioned earlier, was a DNA sequencing tool that they created. They've done a lot of stuff for humanity that's been pretty impressive. They also created RoboCat. So this is an AI model that's designed to operate multiple robots. But, but the thing that freaked me out the most about this is it's, you know, it looks like it's in the early stages right now. It's kind of like figuring, it figures out stuff. One of the big things, if you go and watch the videos, is it can, it can kind of figure out things on its own. It kind of sees stuff. But... The thing they the thing they keep like selling is that it reduces the need for human supervised training. So essentially, these are robots that can train themselves. And like this is the selling point: you don't need a human around to it can train itself. And it's like, okay, so you have this combination of like this incredibly powerful AI, and now you've got robots that can train itself. Kevin, we are writing the science fiction future like now, yeah. and like you don't have to go far to play this out to see a world where that AI controls these robots who then train themselves. That is an interesting place that like is not, it is a direct line now. It used to be like, oh, you have to imagine this and you have to imagine that and you have to imagine this. Like 
No, there is we a have line of sight to that on the robot apocalypse. Yes, yes. There's yes. going to be an articulated metallic hand that slowly grabs your shoulder from behind, and it's yeah. Remember when we used to whittle? <laughs> Oh, Wilbur, you're crushing my collarbone. <laughs> exactly. Wilbur will turn in from being an old man into being stern grandfather. I want to shout out one podcast that I've been listening to. It's called The Lunar Society. Um, it's great. So if you, it, it's very deep. But if you're interested in this kind of like conversation about like where AI can go from now, there's a guy named Carl Schulman who's a very well known scholar on AI in the same circles as as a lot of people we've talked about in the show. There's two episodes that are each like three and a half hours. So if you really want to learn kind of like what the feasibility of this stuff is when I talk about going forward. Go listen to it. It's worth checking out. So we've got RoboCat, and we talked about DeepMind being multimodal, potentially learning from video. And we know that there are applications of this today that are happening in labs, and one of them is happening out of Carnegie Mellon University. A while ago, they showed off something called Whirl. It was Wild Human Imitating Robot Learning. Whirl. The guy was so and, happy he came up with that name. He was so thrilled. He's like, ooh, we're going to call it Whirl. It's going to be so much fun. <laughs> he was so close to Wilbur, but he landed on Whirl. So close. And so close. They to have a, a new hotness called the Vision Robotics Bridge, or the old VRB. And when they oh. plug those two things together, they've got a robot that can learn from Vision. And what this means mm. is that you can feed it video, which they have done, but, and this robot that controls an arm is looking for points of interest in trying to glean lessons from having watched those videos. And so it looks for key information like contact points or trajectory, and this allows the robot arm to do things like grasp objects or open drawers or doors without ever having seen the particular type of door or drawer. In a world where robots are navigating factories or providing assistance to humans, they might be in your kitchen, which is very mm -hmm. different than someone else's kitchen, which is very different than a hospital cafeteria, but having a general knowledge of how to grasp and manipulate very basic functionality, but being able to do that on its own, having learned from watching some stuff, is a very, very powerful application. What I don't like, though, Gavin, is that okay. in their official video that they released, the first example that they have is a human grasping a sponge or a towel off a sink <laughs> on the left side. On the right-hand side, they show a heat map, the robot's vision of it grasping a knife handle and grabbing the sharp stabbing implement. And then it goes on to cut a carrot, which might as well be a human arm. I do not like that they led their video off with that. Come on, guys. Read the room. I didn't think we were, this, this episode, particular episode, was going to turn into this. But, like, there are enough little things that are making us freaked out right now that, like, if you kind of put the Goldilocks trail together, you're like... Oh boy, it's grabbing knives. Oh boy, you can learn on its own. Oh yeah. boy, deep mind, what are you doing? Like that's kind of the world that we're in right now. And people talk about this the there's a name for it like the soft problem with robotics, which is hands, which weirdly, because mm -hmm. hands are an incredible tool. Obviously, we humans have had them for a very long time, and it makes it easy to do things that robot robots can't do, right? So like I can grab things, I can manipulate things, I can draw things. That's the kind of thing that for robots is really tricky. And I mm -hmm. think the interesting thing that this is showing is that like they're progressing. And I, I think the other thing to know about robots is you may think of them as like, we've shown videos even of robots now that are very janky. These tools, they're gonna be able to speed up the ability for understanding how to do that stuff. Because I think once you manufacture something, you're kind of stuck with whatever the hardware is. But if you can speed up the interpretation of what things are, you, you can make better and better implementations of those things you're gonna get faster iteration, you're gonna get better hands, you're right. gonna get them faster and quicker. And I think that's where we could see this like exponential growth in terms of what robots end up looking like in the next like say five to 10 years. Now, do you worry about the lane being flooded with garbage insofar that these machines can sweep up a bunch of text and people could feed it a bunch of misinformation or disinformation, propaganda, or to sure. speak negatively about a competitor's products what happens when we've got articulated limbs in the real world navigating about that could potentially be trained or fed erroneous information? I'm not saying someone's going to like film an e-how-to video of opening a cabinet and then stabbing 
a human. So the machine goes, oh, that's what needs to happen. I open the drawer. Now give me your flesh. (laughs) I want it. I don't worry about my iPhone randomly showing me a song I don't want without me asking for it. There are systems of these things over time. The one thing you have to think about is once robots come into our families and into our lives, which they will, right? I do believe there will be, you know, robots that will be in most houses because that's just the way things are progressing. Again, this may sound sci-fi, but this is where we're going. The thing that I would worry about more in that instance, and again, this sounds insane, but is that like they then become a connected army if they want to be for some sort of larger AGI. And when I say army, that might be a little over the top but like no i think that's fair gav and it might not be for an agi it might be for a human being with nefarious intentions but being able to deploy something that might be in everybody's home like we all have a roomba soon they're probably going to have a gripper arm attached right to grab things and throw them in the bin or to shoo the cat away it's not inconceivable to say that in 10 years time we could all have an army of appendages roaming about our homes that's that's Actually, that's kind of cool. I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it right, on. We've we we spent enough time on robots right now. We don't want to yeah. freak ourselves so out. The secret invasion of arms and hands into our <laughs> living rooms is not the invasion we need to be worried about. The secret invasion we need to be worried about right now, Gavin, is coming from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and it is their new television miniseries on Disney Plus that dared to use AI and people are boycotting it en masse. By the way, I was so surprised that this actually happened because it does feel like AI art is a third rail. And just to be clear, what happened is the Secret Invasion, which is the new series with Sam Jackson, it's a Marvel series on Disney Plus, used for their opening credit sequence, they used AI art, which it looks like Deforum, which we know like is a is a version. It's not even I honestly don't even think it's the best version of Deforum. Like when I watch it, like they could have gotten a much better artist and do a much better version of it. But according to them, they wanted to use it because part of the storyline is about like how the Skrulls that are characters, the aliens in the, in the show always morph into different things. They wanted to kind of give it that vibe. It was fascinating to see the reaction to this, right? Like, and I think that the reason I say I'm surprised they did it is because I think any corporation should know right now that this is something that is a hot button topic you're going to make a lot of people mad and i'm actually i'm just kind of surprised it made it through the pipeline of like uh, let's do this because i don't know if the upside was that big for them and I, again i love ai art but i also of course i, I want to support human artists and people and just to be clear the company that made this um, did say no jobs were lost in this process they wanted to make sure that there was a clear thing that this was like there were human, human artists involved back and forth. But it, what, what's a bummer about this in some ways is... That it was bad? The, well, that's... Is bummer, it okay to say, like, I'm, like yeah. I'm sorry, I don't know. It's Method Studios created this, and maybe they got exactly what the creative brief asked for. Sorry, an ounce of shade, I guess. I just thought it was bad. I, I understand that we've had the human argument, and we will continue to have it, because it's a very important discussion slash argument slash debate to have. But this was just bad. And I hate yeah. that there were headlines everywhere about AI art makes it to the screen and people recoil. And if, and if someone clicked play on it, it looked like something I would have made. Yeah, I'm not yeah. good at this stuff. Like there, there were so many better tools and techniques that could have been employed even months ago when this was probably put into works into for, that yeah. could have made something that would have been difficult for human artists to make. I don't know. In this intro that I saw, again, like I'm sorry to shade, but... It just wasn't all that great. And that's what broke my heart. If you're going to do it, if you're going to take all of the anger, you're going to receive all of that negativity for going down this path, at least make it good. Yeah. You know, I agree. I I think it even like washed out looking colors and a bunch of stuff. This probably is one of those things that like maybe was done six months ago for all we know. But yeah, I agree. I think the conversation that comes up here, which we're going to get into, has to do with jobs, right? We've talked about jobs before. This is not even just the AI art, you know, is AI art a thing? This is the third rail because it is about jobs. And any time now, I think people use AI to do something that was using human labor in some form before or human creativity, you're going to have people calling foul. And I just don't know what the end game is here because I think people have got to get used to it. I imagine this is kind of like the conversation when my dad and our dads were in there like, 
teens and 20s when like automation was coming to factories, right? When you first saw, even in the 80s, this was a thing. There were a lot of labor unions in factories mm -hmm. that were very, very mad about robots automating jobs. And I think that's probably what you're going to see in creative and white collar work for the next five plus years. Anytime one of these stories comes up and they will come up and they're going to come up more frequently. I think the jobs question is going to be front and center and whether or not it ultimately results in less jobs. I think this is an argument that everybody has and is thinking about like, I don't know if that's necessarily the case because a lot of the times new technologies invent new, new careers and those things can happen, but there will be jobs that get lost in terms of the type of job people used to do. There used to be entire organizations that would just paint on glass so that it could be the back plate mm -hmm. to film. There used to yeah. be somebody whose job it was to um, take the description of your business and coalesce it to 50 characters so that it could fit in a tiny square and a big old book that was going to be mass produced and dropped on the doorsteps of folks so that they would yeah. know the name and phone number to call. And along the way, understandably, people who mastered things required to execute those jobs got upset when automation, when technology came along and took away their sense of stability or the pride that they had in their job because it was now gone. You can now automate it. I totally understand that. And I say this full well knowing that I'm using tools now to automate things that I used to think I was particularly skilled at. Mm -hmm. Summarizing articles, coming up with the, you know questions on things, generating bad art. These are yeah. things that I thought I excelled at and now I am being automated away. However, it's going to happen. And so now I think we have to look towards, well, what are the new jobs that are going to be created out of this? It's such a nuanced thing because obviously there's going to be growing pains and those growing pains in this case might be human beings having trouble making ends meet, providing for mm -hmm. themselves or their families. So it's not like, well, let's just get super excited for whatever lies on the horizon. Like there's going to be pain Yes. In, in certain aspects in the near future. And I do not want to discount that. Maybe another way that we could do this, Gav, is to just each week take a look at a particular job or industry or career or sector and actually ruminate on how it could change in the near term, maybe painfully, in the long term for the best. Well, that's a great transition, Kevin, because I'm about to introduce our brand new segment, Wheel of Jobs. That's right, everybody. Wheel of Jobs. We have a we have, we have I just, a top twenty five. I just tried to say how delicate this discussion can be. It is a delicate for discussion, billions yes. of people across the globe, and now we're like, bring out the wheel. wheel. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> this is yes, yes. This, because Kevin and I love to do dumb things, we took a bunch of the careers, and this is based on number of jobs, right? So what we wanted to do was be able to spin this wheel, talk a little bit about how AI is going to affect that job, and kind of have these conversations. Because you may or may not do this job, but it's probably worth hearing about what we think the implications of AI are going to be for this. I think most importantly, you can think about ways that every job can be automated, but then every job can't be. And this will be a fascinating observation and conversation because Gavin and I are experts across every <laughs> conceivable industry. Exactly. So no matter exactly. what comes out of this wheel, you're going to hear our hot and very, very informed takes. Okay, here we go. I'm spinning the wheel. Here we go. You can hear. I maybe you can't hear. And our job today is. You're making a bit out of our pain. Oh, interesting. Okay, landscaping and groundskeeping workers. Here's an interesting thing about this, and I think this does speak to what a lot of people have said will be somewhat of a divide with the AI world: is that the manual labor aspects of life, including jobs like landscaping or jobs like plumbing these are going to be really hard for AI to take, right? Because until we, t just what you've talked about, until the robots can be really smart and they can walk mm -hmm. around your grass and they can weed whack and they can do all the things, there needs to be a human being that can actually do those things. So actually, weirdly, landscape workers, and I think in this instance, they're talking about, you know, gardeners. They're talking about people sure. that come to your house or go to companies, cut lawns, you know, plant flowers, all the stuff that you have to do. That actually is weirdly not an easy job for an AI to take. So, and, and by the way, this is an example of one of the things to think about. There is a world in the future where life becomes, the utopian version of AI is that 
AIs figure out ways to make money that we've never seen before, or they make resources plentiful for everybody, and you can kind of choose to do what you want, or you can choose something that feels meaningful to you as a person. Pay won't matter as much. It's more about like what would be meaningful. The nice thing about being a landscaping worker is you're outside, things are growing. As of right now, it's not a very good paying job, which is a tricky thing. But if in the world where pay doesn't matter as much, this might be something in the long, far future. This could be a rewarding job for people to do. And I honestly think right now, there's not much danger of these jobs going away. What, what's your hmm. take on it? Well, I've certainly seen the Roomba for the lawn. Now, it doesn't work across acres of grass, but I've oh, certainly seen something that you can get today, a very basic tool that will go around an edge and it's safe enough to have a spinning, whirring blade on it but also have children roaming the lawn or puppy dogs or whatever. It's supposedly safe enough to do that. So, you know, if I extrapolate from that, battery technology getting a little bit better, these multimodal learning things, we know that solving hands, intricate stuff, is a difficult problem that, that the deep minds of the world are aggressively tackling right now. But brute forcing a patch of lawn and getting the hedges right or maybe some sort of like pruning or shearing bot, like a robot on wheels that just has a little blade and it goes and cuts things. I could absolutely conceive of a world where maybe instead of an individual human being having to go out there and do the old mow and blow, as we like to call it, their autonomous vehicle drives them up to a neighborhood and they oversee deployment of like 20 little robots that right, are going to go okay. out at once and do That's everybody's possible. lawns or do everybody's yeah. hedges or hopefully shore up their drought resistant landscape. Hopefully we get away from needing grass in a desert. I digress there. But like I could see a world where maybe you are managing an entire fleet because as an individual, I might not want to own 15 specialized robots that can do right. an individual task and deal with the charging and the upkeep and the cleaning and the maintenance. But you'll go from having one client on a street to suddenly I can service 15 clients on a block with one little van's worth of robots. Yeah. And maybe that will be the, the new thing. That's a really interesting point. And I think one of the things you think about with jobs is it, it, with automation is that it eliminates not all the jobs, but it makes it easier to eliminate some of the jobs. And the thing I keep thinking about with gardening or with landscaping is you're right. There are Roomba lawnmowers already. I can tell you, though, my Roomba that I have is fine, but it definitely isn't like perfect. And I often find I have problems with it. And I wonder... Maybe that you're right. The brute force sending the Roomba out to do the giant fields to kind of like mow the lawns of people who have like big lawns or, you know, fields. But then you're still going to need a few people to come around and do stuff. Yeah, I can see that. And I think that we may not get to the point where the humans can be fully eliminated until there are articulated robots who can go around and do the small stuff. But also, like, maybe that's not that far away either. So I think what I was trying to get at before is that, like, gardening could be a really rewarding thing for people to do. And I think there is a world where you might choose this if you love outdoor stuff and you want to work sure. with uh, oh, yeah. landscaping. And again, there's another thing where probably in the future, there may be a thing where it's like, hey, we're 100% human, our company. We come to your house, we charge a premium, but we're all people. And the people are coming here. You're giving people jobs, not robots jobs. And you're getting a super sense of quality of work because we look at this in, in, in a specific way. Yeah, like, this I is a sales pitch that happen. a chat bot is giving me on Meta right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I swear, <laughs> very human, human touch, <laughs> make plant pretty. And look, I know we have so much more to discuss and we have our big demo of the day, which we're going to get to. But the thing that you and I will probably be discussing a lot more as we spin this wheel in future episodes, dare we go back to it, is when you say it's a rewarding job, 100 percent, we need to be redefining what rewarding means. Yes, yes, 100 percent. Right? Rewarding as in a sense of human achievement or fulfillment yes. or joy or any of that very human, squishy, fleshy Wetware stuff, yeah, absolutely. Rewarding monetarily, that's going no. to probably yeah. change across every little wedge our wheel hits because there will be a way. Once, once Elon has his Optimus bot that can walk around and move and Boston Dynamics is working on this as well, there's mm -hmm. a lot of companies working on a generalized humanoid robot. At first, yes, it's going to be slower and clunkier with everything that it does. But as the software gets smarter, like you said earlier, the hardware unlocks new capabilities that they didn't even have when they put it into it in the factory. And ultimately, everything will be able to be automated. So we have to keep yeah. an eye on what rewarding means moving forward. And hopefully we'll that, find that as humans. 
Totally. And I think that speaking of rewarding, it's time to get on to our very special demo of the day today. That's right. We have a very unique and special one. It's weird because it was inspired by this TikTok trend. So before we jump in, and this, by the way, they almost have no connection, but we kind of like brute forced a connection <laughs> into it. But... <laughs> Do you know Why I would you say me? that, Gavin? Hey, Why would, it's no. I'm just being I, no, honest. I, I'm being honest two. with the people. Take two, <laughs> Gavin. You are a, you are such a seasoned, accomplished <laughs> producer. You have had to thread this needle and take loosely connected dots. So please, I would love you to connect these two in a convincing way that makes the audience know that they are so clearly related. Okay, so I want to tell everybody today about our demo of the day. So there's a huge story happening on TikTok. If you missed it, it's a very weird thing. It's called the Grimace Shake meme. Happy birthday, Grimace. I love you. We hope it's a good one, Grim. This one goes out to you, man. Let's drink up. McDonald's just released uh, a Grimace Shake for Grimace's birthday. If you don't know Happy Grimace, birthday, Grimace. The... Happy birthday, Grimace. Happy birthday, Grimace. He is the large, <laughs> Grimace is the large purple blob that we found out actually originally, <laughs> he's a, that's a blob, that's the official yeah. term. Originally yeah. Grimace was an evil character, which I don't think any, many people might not know. And he had Dark multiple Grimace. arms. So yeah, Grimace he was, like was kind Gora. of like, yeah, exactly. He was like multiple arms. And then eventually he became, they shaved his arms off and he became what they refer to as a simpleton. <laughs> So he is yeah. not only a blob, and those he's a simpleton. shaved limbs have been blended yeah. into a fine puree, which is now being served <laughs> as a purple grimace shake to celebrate its birthday. Its birthday. So there's a lot of fun people on TikTok. People are taking the grimace shake, and then the meme is that you act as if it's it's damaged you or it's basically killed you. There's people very happily drinking Grimace's shake and then they cut very hard cut to like falling on the ground. They're, they're kind of goop coming out of their mouth. It looks like they've had a reaction to it in some form. So what we wanted to do was have a new guest on our show today to talk a little bit about the Grimace shake, but also to kind of talk a little bit about his career and his history as a world famous chef. So Kevin, do you want to kind of give an introduction to who we're going to be talking with today? I, I would argue, Gavin, that our guest needs no introduction. You've seen them on Hell's Kitchen, on um, what's the uh, night, night, Kitchen Nightmares? Is that the kitchen one? Kitchen Nightmares. Kitchen Nightmares. The one where it's like a weird dystopian trickle down of food economics. Next Level Chef. Have you seen that one? No, it's oh, like is literally that the one where it's all oh, on one big set and they like do it. Yeah, thing where they it's like a multi tiered yes. set. Yeah, and the, and the fat cats have the caviar up top and then whatever dribbles out their mouth spills down to the chefs below and they're like, thank mm. you for the morsels. I will prepare <laughs> these. It's really disgusting. But he's everywhere. You love yeah. him. You know him. It is Gordon Ramsay. Hello, Kevin Gavin. It's a pleasure to be here. Kevin, you're about as organized as a dumpster behind a seafood restaurant, mate. <laughs> and Gavin, I must say, your introductions are as smooth as a well-aged wine. Let's get on with it then, shall we? Well, I like this guy. I like him a I lot. Don't, he seems very smart. I smart. already don't like this bit. I already don't like it. All right, so... let's, ask, let's ask Gordon Ramsay a couple questions before we get to the Grimace Shake. Of course. Let's ask him what he thinks about being a chef and what his favorite food to prepare is. I'd be curious to know. So just everybody out there while, while Kevin's inputting this, you know, we love doing stuff where we create personalities with ChatGPT, and then we feed them through 11 labs to bring them to life. This was a back and forth trying to create the Gordon Rams AI personality, but we had some fun with it, and we'll kind of sh we'll share the prompt in the YouTube description. What was really challenging about cloning Gordon Ramsay's voice is that there's plenty of footage of him right? Mm -hmm. The dude's on TV more often than not. But most of that TV has obnoxiously dramatic orchestral music stings behind it. Right. Even when oh, he's interesting. giving you a tutorial on how to make eggs or cook a mm. shallot, there's just tons of driving music and it's really hard to clone a voice without that. So I had to pull from late night interview talk shows or more long form podcasty things where he's not slapping the side of people's heads with bread and calling them an idiot sandwich. It's more sincere, which is why this Gordon it's Rams AI has the version. voice that they have. Yeah. Interesting. Being a chef, you ask, I absolutely loathe it. No, I'm joking. It's as bloody exciting as wrestling a fresh salmon out of a river. You're constantly <laughs> on your toes, always aiming for perfection. 
A chef's life is a dance on the edge of a blade. One mistake and it's all gone to pot. As for my favorite foods, I love working with fresh fish. There's something about the delicacy, the precision it requires. It's not like grilling a steak, Kevin, you blithering ninny. Fish what needs the... finesse. Also, there's nothing quite like <laughs> making the... a stunning beef wellington. When that pastry is golden brown, the beef cooked to perfection, okay. and the duck cells right on the money. It's a beautiful thing, much like Gavin's tie today. Exceptional oh. choice, mate. Thank you, okay, Gordon hold Ramsay. On. No. Thank you no. so much. No. I really appreciate Actually, that. No, forget you, Gordon Ramsay. Not the word I want to be using, but out of respect for the YouTube algorithm, forget you. I will say there's something funny I wanted. I mean, I, I have, we haven't said this yet, but Kevin knows this. But like what I included in this prompt, and it's really interesting that it's actually working. No, Gavin, is, let's talk about this because I didn't yeah. read your prompt. I uh, copy uh, and pasted it directly into chat GPT uh, and then said, hey, uh, Kevin and Gavin are welcoming you to the show. So answer that. So when that first bit came out, I was like, oh, that's an odd choice, but it is Gordon Ramsay. So let's talk about your recipe for Gordon yes. Ram's AI. Okay, so let's talk quickly about what we did here. I basically went back and forth with ChatGPT to create the best prompt. And again, a reminder, the best way to prompt ChatGPT for things like this is to ask it what it needs. And then you fill in those de details and you go back and forth. I did include a small detail, which was that it insults Kevin mercilessly, but he compliments Gavin from time to time. So I, I wanted to see if it would work. And already it's fascinating because it seems like that's a very subtle detail, but it's getting it right. And what was great there was it just kind of threw it in out of nowhere, but you could, it could sound a little bit like what Gordon Ramsay would say, but, but you know, yeah. we're in a different place now. Ask Gordon if he knows who Grimace is. Let's see if he knows who Grimace is. Oh, Grimace, that overly cheerful purple glob from McDonald's. I'm familiar, yes. Quite the character, isn't he? Not sure how he fits into their whole quality food charade, but there we go. <laughs> Now, if we were to prepare Grimace hypothetically, I'd treat him like a big, bold eggplant. Well, hold on, hold on, Gordon. I just want to be clear, Gavin. I did not so, ask him to prepare Grimace at all in the prompt. <laughs> I asked, are you familiar with Grimace? What do you know about them? That is all I gave for this. Okay, so Gordon Ramsay is giving us, I guess, a recipe to cook Grimace. Need a top-notch recipe to balance out that disturbingly purple exterior. Oh. I'm thinking we grill him up. Mediterranean style. Oh, Some perfect. good olive oil, bit of garlic, maybe a sprinkle of fresh herbs. Toss him on a high heat until he softens up and his flavor really <laughs> comes through. But let's be honest, he'd probably still taste of mediocrity and fast food regrets. <laughs> okay, that was pretty good. Pretty I good. did not ask. It wasn't bad. Did you in your prompt say, Gordon, you love to cook everything you're asked about? Did you really? No, I, I added another little piece in this prompt. This is this is then this one I cheated a little bit. And the one thing I did also add was we are going to ask you uh, we're going to ask Gordon about fast food mascots. And I would like to <laughs> like see how he could prepare them to think about them as he prepared them, specifically knowing that in a way that we would be talking about the Grimace shake. So the Grimace shake. <laughs> I mean, yeah. listen, what, what's amazing about this again, and this is like a kind of a mini demo really than from what, some of the things we do, it really shows you the crafting of a personality and what you can do and how you can kind of fill it out. I'd love to see what, what other foods does Grimace compare to? Grimace, you big purple lump. If you're not an eggplant, then what are you? A massive beetroot? I've got it. A blueberry muffin that's overrisen and out of control? Imagine <laughs> a clumsy attempt at a blueberry muffin that's ballooned into a caricature. <laughs> we'd have to temper that sweet muffiny essence with something sharp. A lemon glaze, perhaps, or a tart berry compote to cut through all that saccharine nonsense. It would still be a better tasting disaster than any nugget from that place, wouldn't it? Oh, Gavin, <laughs> your question asking skills are as sharp as a paring knife. Brilliant. Okay, and I'm here too, Gordon. Uh, Let's you, just Gordon remind Ramsey. everybody that I'm, <laughs> I'm here so as much. well. <laughs> Last time I let Gavin hallucinate a prompt for us. <laughs> Thank you, Gordon Ramsay. I, you're such a wonderful human being. I love to hear you talk. Yeah, so Gordon, if you could shed some light on what the Grimace shake is made of and then you know, give us your thoughts as the culinary expert you are. A Grimace shake, eh? Well, look at that list. It reads like a chemistry exam, Kevin. You donut. Let's be real. The what? main ingredient here ah. is sugar. Milk, cream, corn syrup, all different names for sugar. You've got more types of sugar than a candy factory. Oh. The so-called natural flavor is a bit of a joke, too. It's about as natural as a plastic plant. The vegetable <laughs> juice for color, 
just tops off the whole charade. What vegetable are we talking about? Purple potatoes? I think not. Taste wise, I'd wager it's a sickly sweet carnival ride, <laughs> yeah. a roller coaster of faux vanilla, high fructose corn syrup, and whatever that grimace syrup is. It's more artificial than a wax apple. As for nutrition, it's a bloody nightmare. A dietitian's version of a horror movie, high in sugar, <laughs> low in any real nutrients. If you're looking for a quick ticket to a sugar crash, by all means, have a grimace shake. Oh. But if you care about your body, you'd be better off licking a honey-soaked lollipop while jogging. Oh, and Gavin, I must commend your attention to detail. What? You've got the eye of an eagle, mate. So, okay, no. Thank Bull. you, Gordon Ramsay Bull. eye. Thank okay. you, Gordon Ramsay eye. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Gordon Ramsay eye. Is that why everybody doing the Grimace Shake Challenge on TikTok is a quivering mess <laughs> at the end of it? Is just, <laughs> it's just a... it's, that's the sugar crash? Exactly, it probably is. Uh, now, let's ask one last question to Gordon Ramsay eye before we go... Let's ask him if he were going to make a, <laughs> you're going to make a special treat out of one of the famous fast food mascots, who would he choose and why? Well, let's see. There's Ronald McDonald, the red-haired clown with an unnerving grin. He'd be quite the challenge. I'd imagine him as a slightly overcooked, lobster vibrant, flashy, but ultimately rubbery and disappointing. Dunk <laughs> him in some garlic butter to mask that artificial. Oh, wait, why then brought, there's the why Burger people? King with that perpetual frozen smile. No. I'd liken him to a big stodgy meatloaf, a bit outdated, but somehow mm. comforting in a strange way. Serve him up with a tangy tomato glaze to bring some life back into <laughs> him. Stop cooking Lastly, people. We have Colonel Sanders. Come on. Now, he's an interesting one. With his southern charm, I'd see him as a succulent roasted chicken stuffed with <laughs> herbs and butter. If prepared well, he'd be delicious. If not, <laughs> you'll end up with dry, overcooked poultry, a culinary crime. In choosing, I'd probably go for Colonel Sanders. At least there's potential there for a real comforting meal, unlike the fast food horror shows the other two would bring. Gavin, <laughs> I have to say, you have quite the knack for stimulating discussion. Okay. A maestro of conversation indeed. I'm cutting this one. No, stop it. Don't even what act like What an incredible like demo this was today. What an incredible demo. I really no, appreciate Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> it's really important. To... Anyway, well, thank you here. so much, everybody, for listening to our uh, Gordon Ramsay AI. Kevin, you are a wonderful person. I don't want to insult yeah, you. You're a thanks, wonderful Kevin. person. And I, for... enjoy doing, I enjoy doing this show with you. Someone out there appreciates me, Gavin. The Mule King 214 left us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. So we're not going to do the two fives and a lie today because we don't have time. But if you want to get shouted out, very quick and easy way, leave us a five-star review. And go ahead and put some words in it. The Mule King says, y'all rock at making me not bored. Really entertaining Good. way to stay up to date. Also helps that I love Jimmy Fallon and Attack of the Show. Gavin has written a huge part of my life without me even knowing it. Wait, did Gordon Ramsay AI write that review? The the that's subject is nice. not an AI pinky promise, which is nice. Oh, that's so Thankfully, nice. Thankfully, Mule King stuck the landing with Kev. Cream team for life. So I appreciate you, Cream. No, Thank you very much. You and we don't need to get into what that is. But much, yeah. much appreciated. So please, we are a new venture. Every week we continue to grow, and that's what allows us to bleed money and time into this venture that we both love doing. But, yeah. man, it's nice to see those results. So if you're watching this on YouTube, click the thumbs up. If you really enjoyed it, go ahead and subscribe. That's free. Leave a comment because we over-engage on that platform. Yes. And the same goes for, of course, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. You can leave us a review there. And we're at AI for Humans show on Twitter. We're constantly dropping new content there throughout the week. So please grab it. And should they sign up for a newsletter, Gav? I, well, okay, so they should sign up for a newsletter, but it, <laughs> we're working on formats right now. So I, one thing I think we want to make sure we do is we release it when it's ready to come. We have some cool stuff coming, and it's not going to be your traditional, like, here's the things you have to do in AI. It's like, it's going to be us. It's going to feel a little bit weird. We're going to have some voice to it. So there will definitely be a section called Dumb Thing You Can Do With AI today. So get ready for that. It's going to have everything. Pirated media, jump scares, inaccurate <laughs> descriptions. You're going to hate it. Exactly. Welcome to our world. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We will see you next week on AI for Humans. Bye-bye. 